Hello and welcome to the podcast series entitled In the Footsteps of St. Francis de Sales. My name is Father John O'Neill and I am an oblate of St. Francis de Sales who will be your host as we journey in the footsteps of this great saint. In this podcast, we will focus on the Reformation and Counter-Reformation of the 16th and 17th centuries in Switzerland, specifically in the Diocese of Geneva, for which St. Francis de Sales was ordained bishop in 1602. But before we begin our visit to this important historical site, I would like to take a moment to express my sincere gratitude to Father Viju MSFS, pictured here in front of the parish church near Animas in France, where he is pastor. Father Viju and his confreres, the missionaries of St. Francis de Sales, residing in Valagrande in Annecy, hosted me on, on my visit to Annecy, the Chablais, and Geneva in my efforts to generate resources and to obtain information for this series of podcasts. Their gracious hospitality to me personally and support of this project is deeply appreciated. Although St. Francis de Sales was a Catholic Bishop of Geneva, he never actually took possession of the diocese, nor did he ever claim the Episcopal chair in the Cathedral of St. Peter in the city of Geneva. The Episcopal chair is one of the primary symbols of a bishop's authority in his diocese. From the days of the Reformation, the seat of the Bishop of Geneva was fixed in the city of Annecy, currently located in southeastern France. Our visit to the cathedral will help us to understand the ancient roots of Christianity in the region, dating from the 4th century, as well as the impact of the Protestant Reformation, which started with Martin Luther in Germany and was initiated in Geneva with the arrival of John Calvin and the occupation of St. Peter's Cathedral in 1536. The cathedral is located at Croix Saint Pierre, number six, which is easily accessible by public transportation to the center of the city. Prior to starting our visit of the cathedral itself, let us first take a few moments to visit the recently unearthed archaeological site beneath the church. The entrance to the excavations is located around the corner to the right of the main porticos, located in front of the church. Let us now locate the entrance and proceed down to the archaeological site. Besides admission tickets to the site itself, there are also combined tickets available, which includes entrance to the cathedral towers, as well as the International Museum of the Reformation, all of which are located on site. The sites themselves are open every day from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., and there is no admission after 4.30 p.m. Payment for the admission tickets is in cash only and in Swiss francs. There is no charge for entrance into the cathedral. In preparation for your visit, you may want to access an excellent interactive website for the archaeological site online at Geneva Tourism Archaeological Site at St. Peter's Cathedral. The site itself is in English, French, and German. The archaeological site itself was discovered in 1976 when the foundations of the cathedral superstructure were beginning to falter. In the course of the initial repairs, the remnants of previously existing structures were unearthed. Among the most ancient sites unearthed under the cathedral is what appears to be the remnants of a large dwelling, perhaps belonging to a Roman official that was built during the latter half of the first century. The structure is located on a terrace overlooking the port. It was probably preceded by other buildings in the same location used for a similar purpose. Among the excavations of the ancient Roman site, there was a variety of different artifacts of the era on display at the exhibit that provided a glimpse of the life of the ancient community, along with present-day Lausanne, originally known to the Romans as Lausanne. The rise of Christianity in the Roman Empire had a major impact on the political organization and layout of Geneva in the late 4th century. The bishop became the highest official in the city and ruler of the lands attached to it. Among the exhibits is a layout of the cathedral complex. The complex, which rose on a hill, soon became a distinct quarter within the city. It served as the residence of the bishop and his entourage and a center of religious, political, administrative, and economic activity. As part of the cathedral exhibit is a plaque with an image of the interior of the cathedral depicting the bishop standing in the midst of the early Christian community of that fourth century. 
Also in the same area is a model of a cathedral interior with the following descriptions for the sections numbered in the model. Number one is the north section of the cathedral. Number two, the south section of the cathedral. Number three, the east. Number four is the central baptistry. Number five, the atrium. Number six is the monk's cells. Number seven is the Episcopal residence. Number eight is the secondary baptistry. Number nine is the reception halls. And number 10, the dwellings associated with the cathedral complex. Throughout the exhibit, there are multicolored markers, such as the one depicted here, that provides the viewer with an understanding of the various time periods associated with the excavations beginning in the 4th century through the 11th century. And finally, among the some more interesting sites excavated there, an ancient well, which has been restored and is in excellent condition. You may now pause the podcast at this point before moving to the entrance of the cathedral itself, where you may resume the tour of the church above. The site on which the cathedral now stands was first occupied by a building of the Lower or Eastern Roman Empire, followed by a series of religious buildings that appeared with the establishment of a cathedral complex in the 4th century. The original Gothic cathedral was built between 1150 and 1250. It underwent countless restorations and reconstructions, often following fires. In the 1750s, for example, the crumbling medieval facade was replaced with the present neoclassical portico. Adding to the confusion of styles on the exterior of the cathedral, the two square towers on the east end don't match, and there is a bright green spire from the late 1800s rising above everything else. At the time of the Reformation, all the interior decorations and ornamentation was removed, and the painted decor was covered over. Only the stained glass windows were allowed to remain. What was once the Catholic Cathedral of St. Peter became a Protestant church in 1536 with the arrival of John Calvin. Calvin preached in this church from that period, 1536 until 1564, and the cathedral became the guiding center of Protestantism emanating from Geneva, often referred to as the Protestant Rome. As you stand in the back of the church, you can take in the grandeur of the edifice and let your imagination fill in visual masterpieces of frescoes and colors, which were destroyed or painted over during the Reformation. In contrast to the cathedral's somewhat befuddled exterior appearance, the interior of the church is austere, but nevertheless retains some of the warmth of the original edifice with a pleasant mix of Romanesque and Gothic architecture. The Calvinists had little tolerance for religious images of any kind, nor did they broke any kind of excess in art. So they destroyed nearly everything but the bare architecture. Viewing a few of the images on your mobile device's screen, move about the church at your leisure while we bring to your attention some of the major sites inside the building. As you walk down the center aisle, you can look across the nave and view the beauty of the wonderful gallery and the celestry in its simplicity. As you turn and look towards the rear of the church, be sure to notice the beautiful stained glass windows above the organ in the back in the choir loft. Please take notice also in a special way the rose window and its beautiful arrays of colors above in the loft. As you continue to walk down the center aisle, draw your attention to the beautifully carved pulpit on the left-hand side of the church a pulpit which apparently John Calvin uh, did not use during his time uh, preaching in the cathedral. Please also notice as you walk down the aisle <clears throat> the columns on either side and take a look to see the intricate detail of the capitals of the columns themselves. Also of interest are the fine 15th century choir stalls which have some fascinating misericords. The misericords were carved images on the area where the monks could rest their arms, as well as under the half-seat lids, which could be used for a more relaxed position of half-kneeling, half-seating, to relieve some of the pressure on the knees and backs of the monks. The word misericord comes from the Latin misericordia, meaning mercy. These survived the Reformation because they weren't there at the time, 
They are, they are from a destroyed chapel of the Florentines. Not to be missed on the tour is the famous chair of John Calvin, from which Calvin himself preached twice every Sunday and every working day, every other week before several hundred faithful followers who would gather. In the northwest section of the choir is the Rhone Chapel, which contains a 19th century tomb of the Duke Henri de Rouen from 1579 to 1638, who was leader of the French Protestants and was forced to live in Switzerland. Before exiting the cathedral through its entrance, please notice the small doorway on the left-hand side as you go to exit, and it is a sign there indicating the entrance to the chapel of the Maccabees, which is a very worthwhile visit before you leave. The Maccabean chapel was built in 1405 as a burial and collegial chapel, but turned into a warehouse for salt and gunpowder during the Reformation. At the end of the 17th century, it became an auditorium for philosophy lectures of the Academy, a predecessor of Geneva's university, at which time three interior floors were added to the building. Starting in 1878, the chapel, together with the rest of the cathedral, underwent restoration and gradually received its present-day neo-Gothic look. Today, the chapel is used for weddings and other ceremonies. If time permits, about a 10-minute walk from the cathedral itself is the Reformation Wall, which is an international monument to the Reformation erected to commemorate the 400th anniversary of Calvin's birth. The center grouping of the monument represent William Farrell, who brought Calvin to Geneva, John Calvin himself, second only to Luther in the Protestant Reformation, Theodore Beza, who succeeded Calvin as leader of the Swiss Reformation and was a contemporary of St. Francis de Sales, and John Knox, who taught here before taking the Reformation to Scotland. This concludes our tour of the Cathedral Church of St. Peter in Geneva, as well as its archaeological site, along with a brief visit to the monument wall dedicated to the Reformation. Thank you for joining me on this visit, and I hope that you will continue your journey in the footsteps of this great saint, St. Francis de Sales, in some one of the other podcasts available in this series.